Hey gamers, what's up? So in my previous video, or should I say, on the last episode of Programmer Ball Super, I had a goal to make a game that looks like this and runs on this. It should be a piece of cake, right? Wrong! It is unbelievably hard! So there are these scan lines. A scan line is a line on the screen of a CRT TV. You have to keep track of those lines and count them if you develop for the Atari 2600. Apparently, the 2600 doesn't have enough juice to draw very elaborate scan lines with a lot of going on in them. I found out I can't simply cram the drawing code of the complex background, playfield obstacles and sprites on the same scan line. At first, I noticed I have a problem when I started messing more with the playfield. The playfield is this grid of blocky bricks which can be used as the obstacles in your game. It started glitching as soon as the player sprite walked on it. Then it dawned on me, maybe my code is too slow and it takes longer to draw things than it should. I tried to tweak the sprite drawing subroutine, but the issue didn't disappear entirely. It seemed the more playfield lines I drew on the screen, the slower everything got. At one point, my code got so slow, the game's region switched to PAL, and even the colors have changed. The game started skipping scan lines, and the lines on the screen became super thick. I was about to give up, but I found out that some people actually don't draw sprites and playfield on the same scan line. Basically, you have to draw one line on the screen for your sprite, then you tell for the 2600 to wait for the line sync. And then, in the next scan line, you draw the playfield. When you're done with the playfield's line, you wait for the sync and repeat the process all over. And wow, all the glitches and slowdowns have disappeared. Of course, I lost half of the possible lines on the screen. And all the possible details that I could add to the playfield. But hey, have you seen a very detailed Atari 2600 game? It kind of feels like it's supposed to be this way, since my 8 pixel wide character sprite looked very squished when I drew it exactly 8 scan lines tall. But now, when I skip every other scan line, it looks like the sprite has very normal proportions. This experience changed my perspective on other 2600's games. Instead of wondering why the graphics look so blocky, now I ask myself, how the heck they managed to make all this complex looking graphics? Like how? From that point I started to count the CPU cycles for my drawing code. There could be only 76 CPU cycles for the scan line. That means between two wait for the sync calls, you must have a specific amount of CPU instructions that uses 76 cycles in total. You can't place a complex code there. Everything has to be simple. Usually most of the assembler instructions eats up about 2-3 cycles. But it depends how you use them. Most often dealing with RAM could increase the cycle usage for the same instruction. For instance, loading a constant to a A register takes only 2 cycles. But loading some variable from RAM takes 3. And loading a variable with an index takes 4. But if you are using a pointer to a memory, like something like this, it will eat up even 5 CPU cycles. I discovered that it's better to store everything upside down, like the sprites or the map, because it's faster that way to go through them. Normally you would set the index register to 0, increment it with each line of data and probably then you would compare it with, with some instruction like CPX and only then you would branch out. But now you just set the maximum height to the index register and you decrement it. When it reaches 0, you can branch out using the instruction BNE. This way you need less instructions. It might be uncomfortable to edit your sprite data when it's upside down 
But hey, this way you are saving CPU cycles. The subroutines might seem nice, since they make the code more readable. But in fact they are evil, because calling a subroutine takes 12 CPU cycles. Of course there might be an occasion when you want to jump to some part of your code, but you can't, because the jump destination is too far away. So I guess in this case it's fair enough reason to use a subroutine. My next goal was to figure it out how to draw the asymmetric playfield. As we know, the left side of the screen is repeated on the right. Since now I already knew how many CPU cycles my drawing code uses, it wasn't hard for me to rearrange it so that the storing data to the playfield registers would fit this graph. If we look at the graph, we see that in order to draw the first segment of the right side of the screen, we have to fit in a window from 29th CPU cycle to 49th. So if you look at my code right now, you will see that I'm storing the data to PF0 register right at the 31st CPU cycle, which is good. Otherwise, if I'm too early, I would need to add some instructions to wait several CPU cycles. You can use NOP, which takes two cycles, or it could be a macro sleep, where you can specify how many CPU cycles you want for the CPU to sleep. And that's exactly what I do when I want to store data to the register PF1. So I waste 4 CPU cycles. If I'm too late then I would need to rethink my code and probably store the data earlier. Since I was skipping every other scanline for the playfield, the asymmetric playfield drawing didn't work for me. I could see some occasional stripes showing on the right side of the screen, but that was it. Luckily I tried to clear the playfield registers at the moment when I switched to the sprite drawing. This created some sort of a line effect for the playfield. But hey, it worked and, and now I have the asymmetric playfield. To celebrate my achievement I tried to draw my channel's name from arrays that I specified in ROM. Later I created 6 arrays of 12 rows in RAM and started using them instead of the ROM data. I, at first I just copied the data from ROM to them. But later I started working on a gigantic subroutine that fills the so-called screen map with the data from the logix map. So at this point I had two maps in the RAM. By the way, did I mention how I managed to fit the so-called 91 byte game map into the RAM? I decided that I would only need 4 bits per map cell. So in one byte I could fit 2 map cells. This way I managed to fit my map into 46 bytes. Also I had to change the size of my game map to even numbers to make my life easier. How the heck I even come up with these weird numbers like 13, 7, jeez. Now it's 12 on 6. So the total map size in the RAM now shrank to 36 bytes. At that point I had only 10 bytes free in the RAM. It was fine. Even though I saved some memory, working with the map became harder. Because instead of checking the whole byte as a number, now I have to mess with bits. This way I had to write more assembly code. And as you know, more code means more CPU cycles and more time wasted. At this point I felt how tough this CPU cycle memory juggling is. The 2600 is so slow you want to use more RAM to pre-calculate things. But there is no RAM. So you try to do more calculations, but there is not enough CPU cycles. To test the filling of the screen map, I created a pattern of checkers in the logix map. At this point I've noticed that my screen map filling code hogs all the time in the vertical blank period. So I had to move most of my code from there to overscan. 
I squished the size of the map on the screen so I could in future fit some score below. And after I did that, I've noticed that the tiles on the screen now are square and not elongated. So that's nice. Then I started to toy with the player sprite and limited its movement so it won't go outside of the map. I used the RFP0 register and flipped the sprite so it would face the direction it is moving. To make things more fun, I also added two frames of animation. For that, I used pointers. Apparently, you need two additional bytes of memory to store an address that points to a animation frame. The green bar on the screen is the player 2 sprite, which I want to use to draw ladders. Then I thought maybe it's about time to add some more interactivity since it's supposed to be a game. So I calculated approximately at which cell of the map the sprite was in and when you hit the joysticks button, this cell is destroyed. Well, not entirely a single cell, but two cells at once. Then I added even more animation frames to the player sprite. A climbing frame when you move up and down and a mining frame when you destroy map tiles. The ladders by the way are supposed to be very important in this game. I tried to transform the green bar into a long vertical line of ladders. I noticed that it resulted in some pixel twitching, especially when I move the player sprite through them. That means the sprite drawing code is going over 76 cycles. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. I will need definitely to clone the ladder sprite at least four times. It seems it's not gonna be easy, so I abandoned the ladders for now. Since the very beginning, this project had this problem. Sometimes when I launch the game, the sprite moves very oddly, as if it teleports every 10 pixels. I had no idea why it was happening. I tried everything. I tried to change the horizontal movement code, but nothing helped. Eventually, I solved this problem by using a clean start macro at the beginning of the game's code. So the random sprite twitching is finally gone. By adding new variables one after another, I noticed that for some reason I can't use the 5 last bytes in the RAM. Stella shows that they are filled with some kind of data but I can't change them. Apparently, the RAM is used also by the stack. Surprise, mother The CPU stores a return address when the subroutine is called. The deeper you go into subroutines, the more bytes are used. So each subroutine call eats up two bytes in RAM. So I, so I knew the subroutines are freaking evil. So I guess I officially ran out of RAM. It's still fine. I found out that I can reuse some of the variables that were used only in some subroutines. I guess I could call them local variables. Plus the current memory arrangement is not set in stone. And I still might redesign things. Then I decided to improve the mining to make it more accurate. So you could destroy a exact cell that you want. After that I thought maybe it's a good time to make a collision detection so the player could not go through the ground tiles. So I tried the hardware based collision first. The 2600 has several registers where it stores the collisions between sprites themselves and the playfield. The collisions are registered after the screen frame has been drawn. So in order to know if your dude is colliding with a wall, he has to be drawn inside of the wall first. I did not like it much because the character got stuck in the obstacles a lot. Even though you can save a lot of CPU cycles since you only need to read the register and check the bits with the end instruction. I chose to write my own collision. It is similar what I used in my C++ code, but now it's an assembly. For now the collision is checked only when the player moves to the left or to the right. You still can go through the ground tiles if you move up or down. That's not important right now. 
going up will be not available at all and you will be able to go down only if you reach a ladder. So let's see how it all looks on the real hardware. No! What happened? It was fine on the emulator. I'm guessing it's due to the fact I did not draw remaining scan lines and the emulator showed 72 Hz instead of 60. Let's draw some Adidas stripes with the remaining scan lines and see if my theory is correct. And it is! Apparently, the frequency Stella shows in its debug output is very important. Now everything looks as it's supposed to. Except the character moves up a bit too rapidly. It seemed okay on the emulator though. While testing this mess on the real hardware, I had a crazy idea. What if I could make a 2D Minecraft clone on the Atari 2600? How insane would it be? <sighs> if only I had additional 1K bytes of RAM or at least another 128. Now the main remaining question is how the heck I'm gonna draw lava? Since it's somewhat obvious to me now that the playfield is supposed to be of one color. It might have different colors per scan line, but having different colors on the same line is not something you see on the 2600 very often. I have a few ideas right now, but I'm not sure if they will be successful. So who knows, I might give up on this project entirely. But you will find out that on the next episode. So stay tuned and subscribe for more. As previously, you can find the code with all the changes and my git repository on github. The link is in the description. I've also put a ROM to the repository. So even if you don't code, you can still try it out on an emulator or whatnot. So thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.